Welcome to Word of His Power 2024. Now open your hearts and get ready to receive a touch from heaven as we trust God to advance each of our lives for such a time as this. As always, why don't you find two or three people, tell them how glad you are to see them tonight. I know you came expecting. Now, if you are expecting, why don't you take both hands and throw them up to heaven and give the Lord a shout of thanks ahead of time. Come on, lift his name tonight. Lift him up. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We're so thankful. We're so thankful. We're so thankful. We give you praise tonight.
I need, the Bible says, let everything that hath breath. Let me breathe just for a second. You are a God all the time, all the time. You are a God, you are a God all the time. What key? I thank you. I thank you for all you've done and all that you will do. You're faithful. I'm grateful. Lord, I thank you. It might be new to you. Everybody see me.
way to sing that without thinking of way too many things. Man, there's so many things. You just think about everything he's done for you. Not just in the past, but what Jerry, Brother Jerry said this morning, what he's getting ready to do. You haven't seen your best days yet. You haven't had your best times yet. You haven't had your greatest days of increase yet. You haven't had your greatest miracles yet. So I thank you. I thank you for all you've done and all that you will do. You're faithful. I'm grateful. Lord, I thank you. Still one more time. I love to hear y'all. Take it to unison. I thank you, I thank you for all you've done and all that you will do. You're faithful, I'm grateful, you're faithful, you're faithful. I'm Take a moment, thank him. Just take a moment. You lift up your boys and thank him. Jeff and Reba, come to the platform if you will. Now, most of you know she really doesn't need any introduction. Reba Rambo. Reba, thank you so much. You want to give her a hand of appreciation. You know, guys. Thank you so much. They just came because they felt led to come. I love when people just let the Holy Ghost lead them. And, and, but you might not know the guy standing beside her. His name is Jeff Ferguson. Give him a big appreciation and a, a God bless you and a welcome. And here's the deal. You've sung his songs, you just don't know it. He's a very prolific songwriter. Really, honestly, he is a great songwriter. And so we, we, we uh, weren't going to do this song that I'm getting ready to do till tonight. But we kind of slipped into it this morning. We snuck it in, yeah. Jeff, can you give an abbreviated version about Healing Place, how you wrote that? So I was in, I was, I was, I was in the, a church of about 400 seats in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I'd walked through some really difficult things and they opened the church on Saturday for everybody to pray. And the next morning was a service I was ministering at. So I went to the church to pray. I was the only one in there. I had to use the restroom. To the side, there were restrooms down a hall off the platform where the musicians and singers and pastors would use those restrooms and one of the toilets was dirty i found i knew that it had to be cleaned by the next morning i found the utility closet and i cleaned that toilet and i ended up cleaning every toilet even though they didn't need it but something in me needed to clean it and i cleaned every toilet in that church it took me about three hours while i was praying I got back to that empty altar area. No one was there yet. And I began to pray through a broken heart that I had walked with for about two years. And God told me, he said, in this place today, son, I'm going to heal you. And I wrote this song in that altar. So I wanted you to tell you that story because maybe your story doesn't match exactly those details, but everybody's got a story. Check this out. In Bible-believing, word-confessing, word-of-faith-believing churches, 
everyone has at least one or two challenges. Shocker, news alert, right? And you have a place that you need, you need healing, right? See, everybody's afraid to say amen right there. Amen. But it's a really good place to say amen. I wanted to do this tonight. You have something, don't you? Do you have something? Did you have something you wanted to add? Okay. Because I know her. If she has something, I want to hear it. But you might before the service is over. I was just checking. I was just saying. So anyway. This psalm is unusual in that it's Jesus speaking. That's a very unusual for a song. I want you to sing this and I want you to receive healing. Not just for sickness and disease. Maybe come into wholeness where something's missing and something's broken. It can be a healing place at whatever place you need it to be. Can somebody say amen? Hey, Jeff, this is a... Is your mic on? This is a healing place. There is a warm embrace within these walls of grace. This is a healing place. Everybody in unison. This is a healing place. He's too loud in my monitor. This is a healing place. There is a warm embrace within these walls of grace. This is a healing place. Just sing the verse. Can you hear it? The still small voice. Hope is where it starts. I'm gonna heal you, child, and mend your broken heart. Can you hear it? The crack of the whip. By my stripes you were healed Yes, it is finished, child By faith you'll see it revealed This is a healing place This is a healing place There is a warm embrace Within these walls is a healing place. Do the chorus again. This is, this is a healing place. This is a healing place. There is a warm embrace within these walls of grace. This is a healing
let's just do one more worship song. Let's do Perfect Heart. Can we do that? Get her her microphone instead. How many of you believe that he can make a perfect heart? Some of you may say, oh, you don't know my heart. And all I can say is you don't know my God. <laughs> Wrote this on a, a lake on a houseboat right at sunup one morning. Morning sun, light of creation, grassy fields of velvet floor. Silver clouds, a shimmering curtain. He is designed a perfect world. I'm amazed at his talents. I stand in awe of one so great. Now my soul begins to sing out to the source from which it came. Sing with me, bless the Lord. In unison. Bless the Lord who reigns in beauty. Bless the Lord who reigns with wisdom and with power. Bless the Lord who reigns my life with so much love. Sing it from your heart. Bless the Lord who reigns in beauty. Bless the Lord who reigns with wisdom and with power. Bless the Lord who reigns my life with soul. just 30 seconds and share the story. We had just written this song and the man that was the head of our record label, Mr. Ralph Carmichael, said, can I get a demo on that? He said, my brother needs a heart transplant and we are believing God for a heart transplant. So Brother Car Carmichael bought one of those tape recorders that you could just keep it going, keep it going, keep it going, auto, auto rewind. And his brother listened to this song hundreds of times. They finally got the call that, that they had a, a new heart for him. 
It said they took him into the surgery to perform the heart transplant and the chief surgeon opened him up and said, what are you talking about? This man has a perfect heart. Give this heart to someone that needs it. How many know that God can make a perfect heart? Hallelujah, say bless the Lord. Bless the Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. Go, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I'm looking at, I'm looking at my own heart. I'm looking at my own heart. When you, when you, when you sing that song, you take it, take it for your own. Take it for your own. Hallelujah. My, oh my, oh my. I don't know if... Dear Father. Do what you want to do in this place. There's things you want to do. There's things you want to say. There's things you want us to hear. Make sure that they come forth, Father. Oh, Holy Spirit, have your way in this house. Have your way in this house. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You're going to have to do this again tomorrow night. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. I mean, okay, okay. I just don't think that any of this is by chance. I don't believe that sort of thing, okay? So whatever is planned by the Holy Spirit, I'm just telling you that's what I want. And we've talked about it too, because I, I don't know what it is. I wish I did, but it's just that I know that it's not going to be the usual. All right, we're not, we're not, we're, we're stepping over into something that, that if, and you know, I can understand why it is because we're supposed to do this by faith. So if he told me everything, it wouldn't be by faith. And he's, he's stretching us to 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 like trust him and um and and you know like your insecurity is oh well what if i do it wrong what if it's not exactly and 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 that's that's a hindrance that's one of those strongholds you know that We've got to get to a place where we just let God do it. And so that's what I want to do in this church. I just want to let 
God do it. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Well, give him one more shout of praise. Hallelujah. Glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated, but just turn to one another while you're doing that and say, I'm glad you're here because we're about to have church, although we have had church already. So with that said, I'm just going to move right on because that's what I like to do. And uh, uh, I, I, for those of you who have um, maybe weren't here last night, we do have Reba Rambo on the platform. <laughs> and I'll say Associate Je Jeff, maybe put it like that, <laughs> because I'm not quite all sure what he does, but he does lots of things. He ministers, he writes songs, he writes books, he writes, he, he has several different ministries and including a marvelous widow's ministry. So, and I don't know all about him, but I intend to. So just, you know, okay. So with that said, I just want to show and make sure that they know how much we appreciate this. This is glorious. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. And then I want to welcome all of you and, of course, all those that are watching by the different platforms. We welcome you, and we know it's, it's, it's just been so rich. And it, we've just, we're taken to places that we haven't been. And I, and I know that. I can sense that. And I can, I can sense your faith is growing. I can trust. I, I, you, you feel there's, like, much more trust in, in, running around in this place. Amen. And uh, so I just want to say good evening and welcome all of you. And you know we have something that we always say. You say, why do you say that? I want to tell you why I say it. I say it because Lester Summerall said it. And I figure what Lester Summerall says is okay to say. And it's, it's got to be some power behind it. So we believe for you to be blessed before you leave this place. Amen, amen. And then again, if you will kindly please turn off your cell phones. No video, no flash photography. And then what I want to do right now is, are you, you're finished. Okay, what I want to do right now is bring the man of God to the pulpit. This is a gift, a gift, a gift. Receive Dr. Jerry Savell to this platform. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you. All right, you can be seated. I sure enjoyed the praise and worship tonight. You guys were awesome. And Reba, I need to tell you something. This morning as I was uh, talking about, you know, when I came to the Lord and all, uh, actually before I surrendered my life to the Lord, your mom and dad came to Shreveport. And they stayed in my mother and father-in-law's home. And I got to meet them. I didn't want to meet them, but my wife made me meet them. <laughs> but I remember that. And, uh, and they were such sweet people. And uh, my mother and father-in-law were always one of the major couples in the church that was asked to host the guest speakers and singers and everything. So usually they stayed at their house. And uh, so... Carolyn said, there's uh, some people that I want you to meet tonight. It was your mom and dad. And they were such sweet people. And we enjoyed, I really enjoyed uh, fellowshipping with them, uh, even though I wasn't serving the Lord at the time. But I loved hearing them sing. And that put you on my mind this afternoon while I was praying. And I got a scripture I want to share with you. It's from the book of Isaiah. Chapter 42, verse 9. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Sing unto the Lord a new song. And goes on talking about praising him and so forth. 
You've had a wonderful past, but your best days are not behind you. Your best days are ahead of you. I just want to tell you that by the Holy Spirit, your best days are ahead of you. God is about to do a new thing in your life. Hallelujah. And I'm rejoicing with you. Amen. Let's all rejoice with her. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Good to have you here tonight. And um, how many of you were not here this morning? Where were you? That's none of my business, but I'm glad you're here tonight. Praise God. Amen. Everybody know everybody? Is anybody here tonight? This is not your regular church home. Can I see your hand? All right. Well, we welcome you here. Glad you're here. You're in the right place tonight. Praise God. Thank you for coming. And I, I believe it'll be worth the investment you've made to be here. You're not going to leave the way you came. Hallelujah. Amen. This morning in my first service in this series of meetings, I shared with you two phrases from two different scriptures. And I want to read those phrases once again. One of them was found in Romans chapter one, verse 17, from faith to faith. And the other was second Corinthians chapter three and verse 18. And that scripture is, or that phrase is from glory to glory. Say that with me again, from faith to faith and from glory to glory. Say it one more time, from faith to faith and from glory to glory. When I read those phrases, the first thing I think, of, even though there are many, many meanings that apply to that, but the first thing I think of because of what the Lord said to me coming into 2024, I think of progression. I think of advancement, promotion, from faith to faith, from glory to glory, going from one victory to another victory. And after that victory, going into another victory. And after that victory, we just keep on having victory, praise God. I love living in victory, how about you? Amen. I, I love knowing that I can always depend on God. I've been serving Him now for 55 years and I have this testimony. He has never let me down. He's never failed me. He's done exactly what He said He would do in His Word. And I will forever be grateful for it. And even though I've seen God do a lot of things, in my life and in the lives of other people all over the world, I believe that according to the writings of the Apostle Paul, our eyes have not seen, our ears have not heard, our hearts have not conceived all the things that God has prepared for those that love Him. So no matter how much you've seen, no matter how much you've experienced, we're just scratching the surface. I mean, we got some big things that are about to happen. They're on the horizon right now. New things, praise God. Amen. That we've never experienced before. They're not new to God, but they'll be new to us. And praise God. I remember the first time I met Lester Summerall. I was rented the uh, uh, Niagara Falls Convention Center, and uh, I was doing a three-day conference there. I came out of a a morning service and I was going over to the hotel that I was staying in. And as I'm uh, walking out in the parking lot, a young man came up to me and said, the Lord told me to give you this. And he handed me a book and it was by Lester Summerall. I had not met Brother Summerall at that time. I'd only heard his name, but I didn't know anything about him. And he handed me this book and he said, the Lord told me to give you this. And the name of the book was Run With a Vision. So I took it and went to my hotel room and I had a few hours before the evening service. So uh, I just put on my robe and I sat there at the desk and I picked up that book and was just going to skim through it a little bit, but I couldn't put it down. I read the whole book. As Soon as I uh, read the last page of that book, my phone rang in the hotel and I answered it and he said, is this Jerry Savelle? I said, it is. He said, this is Lester Summerall. <laughs> I said, Lester Summerall? He said, yes. Uh, God told me to call you and uh, I want you in my church Sunday morning. I said, well, Brother Summerall, I'm, I'm in a, a conference here. Uh, I'm at the, the uh, uh, Niagara Falls Convention Center and I won't be through until Saturday night. He said, well, don't you have an airplane? I said, yes, sir. He said, then you can be in South Bend by Sunday morning. 
Now that's the way later when I became very close to Lester Summerall, we traveled different parts of the world. I preached in his church many, many times. <laughs> he used to say, sometimes he'd just show up in my ministry and I didn't even know he was in town. And I'd get a call from my reception and say, Brother Jerry, uh, Brother Summerall is here and he wants to know uh, if you're here. I told him you were. And he's in the uh, reception area and he wants to see you. I said, well, tell him to, somebody bring him over to the executive office. And he said, no, he wants to come. He wants you to come see him in the reception office. So I said, okay. So I, I went there and, and Brother Summerall was standing out there with the receptionist who happened to be my mother. She, she <laughs> had been my receptionist for 20 years until she retired. And uh, so he found out she was my mother. And so he's asking her all about my background and you know, the way I was raised and so forth. And uh, so he said, uh, I said, Brother Summerall, I didn't even know you were in town. He said, well, I've been out in California and I'm going to Houston and I stopped in uh, to tell you you're going to Houston with me tonight. <laughs> I said, Brother Summerall, I can't go to Houston with you tonight. I just got home uh, from a series of meetings and I've got to do television broadcast today. And he said this, he said this to me every time. What could be more important than being with Lester Summerall, than being with Lester Summerall? Wasn't that the way it was? What could be more important than being with me? I said, well, I don't know of anything that might be more important, but uh, is it important to you that I just got home? No, you're going with me to Houston tonight. And uh, so I called Carol. I said, don't expect me home for dinner. I'm going to Houston. You just got home, Jerry. I know, but Lester Summerall wants me to go to Houston with him. So that's the way he was, you know, and he was that way every time I was around him. In fact, every time I preached in his church, he always had a project for me. But come into my office and he'd show me what he was building next. And he said, and you're going to raise the money for it. <laughs> I said, well, Brother Summerall, I'm not going to ask anybody to do something that I won't do myself, so I'll sow the first seed. And so I'd sow the first seed, and then I encourage others to, to follow suit, you know, and he always had a project for me. And then television, live television. Lester somehow worked me harder than anybody I ever preached for. <laughs> I'd fly up there, and I'd do, a, a, the opening service was an evening service. Next morning, he had me in his Bible school, then he had me a luncheon with pastors, then a pastor's meeting, and then live television, and then a radio broadcast. Then we go home and have a cup of soup, and then he'd take me to the hotel, bring me back to the evening service, and then we go to his house, and he'd talk for three hours, and take me back to the hotel at three o'clock in the morning, and we'd repeat the same thing day after day after day. I said, man, you work me harder than anybody. And one time I said, Brother Summer, I'm getting too old for this. He said, hmm. I'm twice your age, you know, you know. <laughs> but he said, uh, uh, one time he said, uh, you know, when I, when I accepted the call to preach, I didn't want to preach. He said, I accepted the call to preach mad. Did you ever hear him tell this, Terry? He said, I was mad at God. I was mad. I didn't want to preach. And he said, take your choice, preach or die. He said, and the only reason I preached because I didn't want to die. I didn't want to preach, but I didn't want to die. And he said, and then when I started preaching, I, I, you know, I fell in love with what God had called me to do. And he said, so then I said to the Lord, this became my prayer. Lord, don't do anything in my generation without including me. I said, whoa, I like that prayer. I believe I'm going to start praying that myself. Lord, don't do anything new in my generation without including me. Anybody like to pray that prayer right now? Yes. Say that. Lord, Lord, don't do anything new in my generation without including me. And why don't we go ahead and give him a praise in advance for it. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I like new things. Anybody like new things? I like new things. I remember when I was uh, just a young boy, uh, my dad worked for General Motors uh, dealerships doing body work. And uh, General Motors was going to come out, Chevrolet division was going to come out in 1953 with a new car they called the Chevrolet Corvette. And they brought my dad up to Michigan and trained him to become a Corvette specialist. 
They were built out of fiberglass. Not many body men knew how to work fiberglass. So they trained my dad to be a Corvette specialist. And then they sent him home and they sent home with him a brand new 1953 Corvette. Now this is 1953 and I'm a little over six years old. And I came home from, you know, being in first grade or something. And I saw this beautiful little car in the, uh, from the back in my dad's garage at the back of our house. And I walked back there and I looked at that car and man, it was beautiful. And I could hardly wait for my dad to get home. I said, dad, is that ours? He said, no. He said, they sent it home with me. And he said, my job is to wreck it and rebuild it. I said, you're going to wreck this car? He said, yep, I'm going to go run it into a tree and wreck it and then rebuild it. And when I get it rebuilt, I'm going to take it out and I'm going to run it into a tree, back again to a tree and tear the rear end up and rebuild it. Now back then, you couldn't buy clip front ends. You couldn't buy clip rear ends. It was little pieces of fiberglass that you put together like a jigsaw puzzle. And I watched my dad take that Corvette and rebuild it time and time again. They said, do it until you can do it in your sleep. And so back in 53, 54, and 55, if anybody bought a Corvette those years in Shreveport, Louisiana, or anywhere in Louisiana, parts of Mississippi, East Texas, or southern part of Arkansas, if they bought a Corvette that year model and happened to wreck it, more than likely, my dad was the man who repaired it because he became a Corvette specialist. So he worked at a place in Shreveport. You may remember it. Renee, my, my dad and, and her dad worked together at Holmes Pontiac years later. But uh, my dad worked for the Chevrolet dealership first, and it was called Howard Crumley Chevrolet, right downtown Shreveport. And Mr. Crumley knew how much I love Corvettes. I told my dad, as soon as I get big enough, this is what I'm going to drive. I'm going to drive Corvettes. Then they came out with that TV series called Route 66 where these two young men rode a Cor drove a Corvette all over Route 66. And I'd sit there and watch that and I'd say, Dad, as soon as I get big enough, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a Corvette and I'm going to do Route 66, you know. And so uh, Mr. Crumley, he knew how much I loved Corvettes. And so he would tell my dad when, when the new model would come in, he'd say, tell Jerry I've got the new model in the showroom. Bring him up here and let him sit in it and let him look at it. And so I'd go up there and Mr. Crumley would come out in the showroom. He'd say, Jerry, you sit in the driver's seat. And he sat in the right seat in the passenger side. And uh, he, he'd say to me, can you see yourself someday owning one of these? I said, yes, sir, I can. As soon as I get big enough, old enough, this is what I'm going to drive. And he'd do that every year. And I remember the last time before he passed away, it was a 1957 Corvette. And he called me up there and he said, sit in this car. And it was a beautiful black with red interior. Had a four-speed 283 engine, you know, and, and oh, that was the most beautiful car I'd ever seen. And so I'm sitting in it. And he said, Jerry, can you see yourself owning one of these someday? I said, Mr. Crumley, I'm going to own one identically to that. It's going to be exactly like this one. Well, you know, I didn't have the money for a new Corvette. They were expensive for cars back in those days, you know. And they weren't practical. There are only two seats. Most families wouldn't buy a Corvette. But, you know, some guy that is single maybe, or maybe he's very successful as a young man, might have the money to buy a Corvette. But most families were not going to spend that kind of money on a Corvette. They need a family car, you know, station wagon, you know, or something <laughs> like that. And uh, so uh, I, I couldn't afford a Corvette. My dad couldn't afford a Corvette. And so... I was in a little town called Hallsville, Texas, it's near Longview, Texas. And it had a, a drag strip. And I used to go to the drag races there. And a guy had a 58 Corvette he was racing and he wrecked it. And I got in my truck and drove down to the end of the speedway and asked him if he wanted to sell it. And I mean, he wrecked fiberglass pieces all over the strip. I said, you want to sell it? He said, yeah, and I, I don't know how to repair this thing. I said, I do. My dad had taught me. I said, uh, you want to sell it? And I just happened to take my dad's car hauler that day. And I hauled that car back to, to Shreveport 
to my dad's shop. When he came home, he looked at this 58 Corvette that was wrecked. And he said, son, what are you going to do with that? I said, you going to rebuild it. <laughs> so my first Corvette was a 1958 model. Okay. Since that time, I've driven Corvettes all my life. The only time I haven't driven Corvettes is when I first went to ministry. And the reason why people told me preachers can't have a car like that. <laughs> Lied like a dog, <laughs> you know? And so I had at that time, just before I, I when, I, when I surrendered my life to the Lord and shut my automotive business down, I owned a 67 Corvette, beautiful yellow 427, four speed. Ooh, it was hot. No, you don't understand. It was hot. My wife wouldn't even ride with me. She said, I'm not riding in that car. You'll race everything between here and the next block. I said, you better believe it. An old woman in a Volkswagen not going to beat me to the next red light. You know, and I just drove fast every, everywhere I went, you know. And so I, I sold that Corvette. And at the same time, I had two 36 Ford Coupes, one a five window coupe that was all original and the three window coupe that I'd made a street rod out of and put a 327 Chevrolet engine in it. And I had a 39 Chevrolet pickup I'd restored. And I had a couple of motorcycles, uh, Triumph Bonnevilles. And I gave all that up when I went in the ministry because I was told you can't have stuff like that. God wouldn't love you if you have stuff like that. Anybody ever heard anything like that? And so I gave all that up. That was the only time in my life that I didn't have Corvettes and motorcycles. And I never, I never went to another race. I never picked up another hot rod magazine. I never rode another motorcycle for three, uh, let's see, for, uh, Nine years. No, I'll take it back. Ten years. And one day, uh, a, a couple came to me and the man said, Brother Jerry, uh, we got saved under your ministry. Uh, we all got filled with the Holy Spirit under your ministry. We, we, we've learned the word under your ministry. And we're a partner with your ministry. I said, well, thank you. That's very kind of you. That's the greatest compliment you could give me is you believe in me to the point that you become my partner. And he said, but we were praying and we asked the Lord uh, what we could do for you personally. I said, well, sir, that's not, that's not uh, uh, needful, not necessary. The fact that you're a partner with my ministry, that speaks volumes to me. He said, no, we, we're going to remain a partner, but we've been praying about what we could do for you personally. And he said, and the Lord told us to buy you a new motorcycle. I said, well, sir, I don't ride motorcycles anymore. I said, I I'm not sure you heard God. He said, well, you're the one that taught us how to pray. We believe we can hear God as good as you can now. I said, well, excuse me. I didn't mean to insinuate that you're not, you know, good at praying, but maybe I'm the one that needs to go pray. I said, wait, right here. So I just walked off a little way and I said, God, did you tell that couple to give me a new motorcycle? He said, I did. I said, why? I haven't asked you for a motorcycle. He said, number one, I know I can trust you with it. It won't come between me and you. And then he said, number two, I know it'll bring joy to your life. It brings joy to you. It'll bring joy to me. Now, I'd never heard anything like that. I thought all I'd ever heard, anything that brought joy to me, God was against. And he said, I know it'll bring joy to you. And if it brings joy to you, it'll bring joy to me. And then he said, now number three, take what once was your passion and turn it into a tool for evangelism. I went back to that couple and said, you've heard God bring me my motorcycle. <laughs> and they, they delivered to me the finest motorcycle I'd ever owned at that time. Oh, it was beautiful. And it was, oh, uh, I started riding it. Brother Copeland started riding again. And that's one of the ways we would have fellowship. When we get off of meetings, we'd, we'd go for a motorcycle ride and have lunch or something or breakfast. And, and that was one of the ways we'd fellowship. And uh, then the Lord said, now take that and turn it into a tool for evangelism. And so later I started the Chariots of Light Christian Bikers. And I have chapters all over the world, chapters all over America. And we do tours, uh, at least four tours a year, riding motorcycles in different parts of the country. I ride them all over the world. I've ridden in Australia. I've ridden in Russia. Oh, you ought to see what I rode in Russia. 
Russia spent all their money on military buildup and they spent no money on motorcycles. It's a piece of junk, bailing wire and duct tape, you know. I got off that bike and it oh, blew all over me. I looked like a raccoon when I got through riding that, that, that bike, you know. And I've ridden them all over the world. And, uh, and, and we have tours all over the world. In fact, we just celebrated two years ago, 25 years of Chariots of Light Christian Bikers. And we started, uh, we started keeping a record of all the people that come to Christ just through that one outreach, because we send teams right now, they're at Bike Week in Daytona. My, one of my teams is in Daytona. And every uh, year we send them to secular rallies all over the world. The biggest secular rally is Sturgis. Sometimes over 750,000 bikers team up in Sturgis and most of them heathen. I mean, you know, you, you, if Paul was the chief of center, this group's number two, okay? <laughs> but we send teams in there and so far, and we have it on record, validated, we have 560,000 people that have come to Christ just through the Chariots of Light Christian Bikers. Amen. So I tell people, if you got a problem with motorcycles, get over it. God's using it. Hallelujah. And then he restored to me, brought back into my life. One of my great passions when I was growing up was classic cars, classic cars. And that's still my hobby. That's the reason my hands are all beat up. Uh, I, I still love as a hobby working on classic cars. Now I can't do full rest restorations like I used to anymore. I don't have the time, but, but I have people that I know that do that. And then I do the, uh, you know, the final touches. Okay. And so, uh, some of the classic cars I have, and most of them are classic Corvettes. My oldest is a 54 and I go all the way up to a number of them. Over the years, God has blessed me with those things. And one day, Carolyn was up in uh, Minnesota teaching and preaching with Lynn Hammond in a women's meeting. And I'm home by myself one of those rare times. And I wasn't out in a meeting. And I looked everywhere in the house and couldn't find a honey-do list. So I thought, okay, today is a motorcycle day. Hallelujah. And I thought, well, I'm going to get up early in the morning. And I'm going to ride down to San Antonio and have breakfast with some friends of mine. And if I decide to spend the night, I will. If not, I'll just ride back home. So I went out there in my garage and I had a brand new uh, Harley Davidson that had less than 500 miles on it. I got on it and rode out of my driveway and less than, you know, five minutes down the road. And I sensed that this is not my motorcycle anymore. So I turned around, came back and I said, Lord, what's happening here? He said, uh, uh, what are you sensing? I said, I'm sensing this is not my motorcycle anymore. I said, if you want me to give it away, tell me who it belongs to and I'll have it in their shop or in their house or in their garage by dark. He said, okay. So I had another motorcycle. So I got on it and I rode down. The same thing happened. I come back and I said, Lord, who does this one belong to? <laughs> I'll have it to them before dark. So I had one more in there and I got on it. Same thing happened. So I left the motorcycles alone and I went and got in one of my classic cars. Had the same thing happen. So by the time Carolyn got home, I had cleaned out my motorcycles and all my classic cars. And when she came home, I was out there sweeping up the garage and she said, where's all your motorcycles and cars? I said, I gave them all away. She said, why'd you do that? I said, I just wanted to show God that he's still number one in my life, that none of this means anything to me other than the fact that he blessed me with it. Now, when Carolyn wants to get real serious with me, here's how I know she's serious. She doesn't call me sweetheart, honey, Jerry. It's the full name. Jerry Savelle, come here. You see this dimple? I was born with it. But since I married Carolyn, it's gotten deeper because this is where she grabs me. <laughs> you look me right in the eye. You understand? God knows he's first place in your life. Don't you ever give another motorcycle away or another classic car away? I said, why not? You don't want me to obey God? She said, I don't want you giving motorcycles and cars away because they come back to you in fleets. 
<laughs> and we have to build a bigger garage. Well, I'd like to show you what that resulted in. That, that's part of my museum. You can't see all of it. That's part of my museum. Okay. Amen. And God did it. And you know what? He hangs out in there. T.L. Osborne told me years ago. Now, Brother Osborne had a, a museum in Tulsa. And many people don't know this, but Brother Osborne owned the, the uh, most exclusive antique Lincoln collection in the world. And he had one antique Lincoln. It was a 1932 Roadster painted pearl white. And he was sitting in his museum. And one day I was up there with him and we're sitting on the running boards. And I said, Brother Osborne, I have no problem with you having all this. I said, but would you, would you tell me one thing? How do you justify it? I know you must get a lot of criticism. You know, people get jealous. People start ugly about you. You're materialistic. If I was materialistic, I couldn't have given it all away. Did you ever think of that? If I was materialistic, I couldn't have given it all away. And Brother Osborne said this, I learned a long time ago that Tranquility produces creativity. Surround yourself with things that produce peace and you'll always be creative. He said, you like classic cars. He said, surround yourself with them. He told Carolyn, you like the sound of waterfalls. You're like flowers, plant them everywhere, have waterfalls everywhere. So I built that museum. You can't see it, but out in the back corner there, there's a desk there. And that's where I go to listen to God because tranquility produces creativity. I get the word of the Lord every year from that spot right there. Amen. In fact, God loves hanging out there because I hang out there. Amen. Amen. Now, I could give it all away tomorrow. Wouldn't bother me in the least. I could give it all away. The only problem is I'd have to build a bigger museum because you can never outgive God. Amen. You can never outgive God. Now that didn't all happen overnight. It was progressive. God is a God of progression. You, 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 Give your all to him. He'll give his all to you. And it will continue to expand and enlarge and increase over and over and over. Not all at one time, but if you remain faithful, if you keep him first place in your life, didn't Jesus say, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added? Go back and look at what he was referring to with other things, material necessities of life. He said, you won't even have to seek them. They'll find you. Amen. Amen. So God is the God of new things. He's always wanting to introduce something new into our lives. Amen. And I really felt that strong today, Reba, and I hope you receive that. Something new is on the horizon. Praise God. Amen. Something new is on the horizon. Say that with me. Something new is on the horizon. Amen. Now, I normally don't show those pictures just anywhere, but I know this church and I, I know you people are people of faith. Amen. Some places I wouldn't show them because, you know, I get ugly remarks, but you're not ugly people. <laughs> Amen. Now, let me show you one other thing, talking about progression, talking about advancement and promotion. Over the years, God has blessed our ministry because he told me at the very beginning, told me 
New Year's Eve night in the watch service at Grace uh, at uh, Life Tabernacle. Brother uh, Moore said he had a, a prophet that he was going to do the that was going to do the uh, uh, be the keynote speaker and close it out and bring us into the new the new year. And so that was the first watch night service I'd ever been in. I asked Carol, I said, "What's a watch night service?" She said, we're going to have church all night. I said, you're kidding. We're going to have church all night? What in the world are we going to do? She said, they're going to do a lot of singing. They're going to do a lot of preaching. There are going to be a lot of testimonies. And then we'll start all over with singing and preaching and testimonies. And she said, and Brother Moore asked a man that he considers to be a prophet, to be the keynote speaker, and he's going to bring in the new year. So I'm looking forward to it. It's my first time to go to one like this, you know. And so they did exactly what Carolyn said they would do. And then they turned it over to the, to the man that Brother Moore considered to be a prophet. And he knew, he knew all the great healing evangelists. He, he, he knew a prophet when he saw one. Okay. And so uh, the, the prophet began to preach and he gave a, a wonderful message. And then at the end of his sermon, he said, The Lord told me bef before coming here today that I was to lay hands on every man in this meeting. So all you men stand up and line the walls of the auditorium and I'm going to stand on one side. Brother Moore is going to stand on the other side. You're going to walk between us. I'm going to lay my hand on the right side of your head and Brother Moore is going to lay his hands on the left side of your head. I may or may not, may not have a specific word for you or may, maybe Brother Moore will. If not, we're just going to lay hands on you, pray. You move on and then the less, next person get in line. So I'm way back here because I, I was sitting in the back and I'm way back here and I'm thinking, dear God, by the time they get to me, we will be in 1970 for sure. <laughs> you know, it's already nearly midnight. And so I'm just, you know, working my way up there and finally I'm next. And when I walk up there, the prophet lays his hands on this side of my head. And Jack Moore pray, laid his hands on this side of my head. And the prophet said, airplanes, airplanes, airplanes. Brother Moore said, oh yeah, Jerry, fly, fly, fly. I don't have a clue what that means. Only time I'd ever been in an airplane. They took me to Fort Dix, New Jersey. And when I served my time, they brought me back. And that's the only time I'd ever been in an airplane. Airplanes, 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 fly, fly, fly. What does that mean? So I walked off and he said, wait a minute, young man, come back. There's more. So I walked back, laid their hands on me, same thing. Airplanes, 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 fly, fly, fly. I still don't know what that means. Hadn't got a clue. So I walked off again and he said, no, 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 come back, there's more. Airplanes, 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 fly, fly, fly. So I just stood there and said, you can go now. So I walked over to Carolyn, because back then, as far as I was concerned, Carolyn and the Holy Ghost were one and the same. <laughs> You know, they, she had to tell me everything about church, you know. And so I said, what in the world did all that mean? She said, sounds like to me, boy, you're going to spend the rest of your life in airplanes, airplanes, airplanes. You're going to fly, fly, fly. <laughs> so when I got home, before I went to bed, I, I wrote that down in my journal. And I said, Lord, what did all that mean? And then this is what he said. There will come a time when you will not be able to fulfill what, you've, what I've called you to do without airplanes in your ministry. Start believing for them now when you don't need them. When you do need them, they'll be there. So I wrote all that down, okay? And it wasn't until 1975, and I'm driving all over the country in a station wagon, a Ford station wagon, with Carolyn and my two daughters and, you know, equipment and so forth. And then it got to the place, I can't get to all the places I'm asked to preach driving in a, a station wagon. So I got that journal out and I reminded the Lord. I said, you said through the prophet, airplanes, airplanes, airplanes. Now notice that that's not singular, that's plural. Airplanes, 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 and then fly, fly, fly. I said, this is what you said, uh, 1970, New Year's Day at about one o'clock in the morning. And then you said, I'd not be able to fulfill what I'm called to do without airplanes. Start believing for them now when you don't need them. And when you do need them, they'll be there. I said, Lord, this would be a wonderful time for that first airplane to manifest because I can't do what I'm called to do without them. And there's a series of things that took place. But shortly after that, I was in my very first airplane. Debt free, praise God. 
Amen. Uh, uh, and the Lord told me, he said, I want you flying airplanes with dead on them, believe for them debt free. So he starts off with an impossible thing in the natural, you know. Now, that was 10 debt free airplanes ago. Okay. And each time when I outgrew one, I would give it to another ministry and believe God for a bigger, better, faster one with more range. And each time God did that. And when I outgrew that one, I'd sow it into another ministry and believe God for the next one. Now, my, my, my uh, way of doing this, I'm not suggesting anybody else do it, but it's, it just helps me with my faith, is when I know what God wants me to have next, I go have a model made of it. Okay? The airplane that I'm believing for next, I have a professional make a model of it, and I have it painted the way I want it painted. I put the end number on there that I want, and a lot of times I'll tell them, and put a little character in the window, and that's me. And then I put it on my desk. So, so every time I'm home, I walk up to it and lay my hands on it and I thank God for it. Amen. Okay. So I've sowed my other airplane as seed for it. There's no such thing as a harvest without first sowing a seed. And the Bible says in the book of Genesis, every, every seed produces after its own kind. Meaning you plant tomato seeds, you get tomatoes. You plant cotton seeds, you get cotton. You don't plant apple seeds, you get peaches. If you want airplanes, find somebody else who's believing for an airplane and sow into their project. You're believing for a new car, find somebody who's believing for a car and sow into their car. You're believing for a new house, find somebody who's believing for a house, sow into their house, praise God. Every seed produces after its own kind. So each time that I outgrew an airplane, I'd sow that airplane into another ministry and believe God for my next one. Okay. And each time, see, I'm talking about progression, advancement, and promotion. Each time we went to another level. Now I want to show you a picture just as a testimony to the faithfulness of God. I'm not bragging on me. If you knew me, I'm not a braggadocious person. I'm bragging on God and his faithfulness. But I want to show you a picture of the first airplane and what we fly now. If you don't call it progression, I don't know what. That one on the end and this now. That's a, that's a Cessna 310. Okay. That's what I flew. That was the first debt-free airplane. That's what we fly now. And I might add, it ain't over. <laughs> In fact, the last time I was here, Richard, you had a, a, a drawing made for me. You still have that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can they show that? And this is, this is my next one. Okay. That's what I'm flying now. And it, it'll take me anywhere in the world. But from here to Africa, which we've flown it to, to uh, Africa last year, but from here, or from Fort Worth to Africa, we, we make uh, four to six stops. And it has over 3,000 mile range. But the next one? One stop between Fort Worth and Gold Coast, Hawaii. I mean, Gold Coast, Australia. And of course, that one stop, you know, uh, I have to refuel in Honolulu. I mean, you got you know, somebody's got to do it and I volunteer to do it. Now, you got that picture? This is, this is what is coming. And that, that's a fine airplane there. We love it. In fact, if I knew that it could do everything I need to do in the future, I wouldn't even think about getting rid of it. But God's the God of new things. He's the God of progression. Amen. And I'm not through. I haven't finished my course yet. And he said, I wouldn't be able to fulfill what I was called to do without airplanes, 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 fly, fly, fly. Amen. In fact, if I went home to be with the Lord before the appearing of the Lord, I want him to put on my tombstone, Jerry Seville, no quit. And airplanes, 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 and fly, fly, fly. Because that's the story of my life. Hallelujah. Amen. There it is. That's the next one. That's a Falcon 900. Okay. One stop between Fort Worth 
and Gold Coast, Australia. Amen. Why do you need an airplane like that? Go with me for one month and you'll find out. Amen. I, I, somebody say, you're too good to fly the airlines. No, I'm not. I paid my dues. How many of you have a card from American Airlines that says you have now flown this one airline 4.5 million miles? Anybody else have that card? Yep. That's just one airline. That didn't include Delta. That doesn't include uh, Lufthansa. That doesn't include uh, Air France. That doesn't, all the other airlines I've flown in between believing for my next airplane. I've paid my dues. Yeah. I've sat in the very back seat on a jumbo jet next to the bathroom for 21 hours. Don't tell me he's too good to fly. I paid my dues. Now I fly, I fly. Every seat is first class. Hallelujah. Now the, the plane I'm flying now can, can, we can see 11 people in there. 14 to 16 in that plane. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Stretch your hands out there and say, Lord, I agree with brother Jerry. Falcon 900, you come into his possession and do so before the year is up. That's what I'm expecting before the year is up. I'm going to be in that plane. Praise God. Amen. God is the God of progression. Say it with me. My God is the God of progression. Now, as far as I'm concerned, when that 900 manifest, I'd be happy for the rest of my life but I know God. I'll probably hear him say when I get it, when I take possession of it, enjoy it for now. Meaning something else is on the agenda. Who knows? That's why I live by faith. I call it adventures in faith. My life is an adventure every day. Amen. Now, you may never need an airplane to fulfill your dreams and your goals. You don't do what I do, most of you. you. You wouldn't need that. But you do have dreams. You do have goals. They're just as important to you as mine are to me. And God's no respecter of persons. He would, he would fulfill your goals and dreams just as much as he would mine. Amen. The only thing he asks is stay in faith. Remain focused on the promises and don't allow anything in the world to distract you. And if you'll do those things, then he says, I'll, I'll cause you to experience progression, advancement, and promotion. And your highest expectations will be fulfilled. Can you say amen? amen. Now, once again, from faith to faith. See, that's an example. Those two airplanes standing there, that, that 310 and the, and the Falcon 50. That, that's an example of from faith to faith. That's an example of from glory to glory. Amen. Progression. That's what, I, that's what I see when I read those two phrases. Faith to faith and glory to glory. Progression. I wrote down this afternoon, one of the meanings of the phrase faith to faith and glory to glory is progressively growing. Another meaning is from one degree of to another. Another meaning is uh, from one level to another. Smith Wigglesworth used to speak of ever increasing faith, ever increasing faith, progressing, growing in faith. Amen. I like to refer to it as one successful faith endure, endeavor to another and then to another and then to another. How many of you can say without any reservation that you truly live by faith. Now, living by faith does not mean thou shalt not work. <laughs> I've never worked so hard in all my life. And I was always, I had, my dad raised me with a good work ethic. I've never been afraid of work, but I've never worked harder in my life than, than a, when I started living by faith. Amen. 
My Bible says faith worketh by love, but it worketh. Amen. Amen. So when I say, how many of you live by faith? I don't mean that you don't work. Living by faith just simply means that you have put your total dependence upon God and his word. And you have 12 jobs doing that. Just don't make them your source. Amen. So living by faith, going from one level of it to another, ever increasing. And every time your faith increases, everything around you increases. That's, that's the nature of faith. When, when your faith grows, everything around you grows. Amen. Can you say amen? amen. Once again, Smith Wordsworth used to re refer to it as ever increasing faith, ever increasing faith. I believe, and I wrote this down. I'm just going to read it the way I wrote it today. I believe you all would agree that the longer we live and the longer we walk with God, we all should be functioning in a higher level of faith than when we began. How many of you can say that you are presently functioning in a higher level of faith than when you first began this walk with the Lord? Now, if you say that, then there should be evidence of it. Then my mic go off, I got no response. I said, if you say that you're functioning at a higher level of faith today, than when you first began this walk with the Lord, then there should be evidence of it. Amen. Amen. Because faith produces. Faith produces. Amen. So there should be evidence. Okay. Paul writing to the believers in Thessalonica made this statement in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. Your faith groweth exceedingly. That sounds like progression. Amen. Exceedingly means to a very high level or to a high degree. The New International Version says your faith is growing more and more. The uh, uh, New American Standard Version says it this way. Your faith is increasing abundantly. And then another translation says, your faith is flourishing. In other words, he's, he's observed them from the beginning when they began this walk with the Lord until the time that he is writing this letter to them. And he sees progress. He sees growth. He sees evidence of their faith. Amen. He, he even said, and your faith is being spoken of in regions beyond. Other people are hearing about your faith. Has anybody heard about your faith? That's so good. Amen. Uh, you surely you got some relatives who have heard about your faith. And they don't know how to believe God, but you do. And so they call on you. Amen. Uh, my faith, and I'm not being braggadocious, but my faith is known all over, all over the world. Amen. They don't, they don't invite me to preach all over the world because I haven't progressed. I, I, my faith hasn't grown. I'm living from day to day, barely getting by. Come and teach us how to do it, Brother Jerry. Nobody tells me that. They, they ask me to come because they've heard about my faith. Amen. They know that my assignment from God is teach people how to be winners in life through the Word of God. That's what I do, man. That's what I do. I told you that when I was here before, right? Where I got that. Remember... Uh, uh, the San Antonio Spurs were playing the championship game. I don't remember who it was they were playing, but nobody believed San Antonio would win the championship, but they did. And they, they went into the locker room after the last game and they walked up and I believe it was uh, David uh, Robinson. Rob, Robinson? Yeah. I believe it was him they walked up to and they put the mic in his face. And they said, uh, David, nobody believed 
that you guys would win the championship. How did you do it? And he stood up, he's about nearly seven foot tall. He said, it's what we do, man. It's what we do. <laughs> I said, that'll preach. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. So people say, brother Jerry, how did you win that victory? How did you overcome that adverse? It's what I do, man. It's what I do. <laughs> Try it. You'll like it. Say, it's what I do. It's what I do. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So we go from faith to faith. It's what we do, man. It's what we do. We go from glory to glory. It's what we do, man. It's what we do. Amen. We're constantly progressing. We're constantly advancing. We're constantly experiencing promotion. That's the life of faith. Amen. People that go around saying that faith movement is over, they don't know anything about faith. It's not a movement. It's a lifestyle. And it's designed by God to make a winner out of it. This is the victory that overcometh the world. What even our faith. Hallelujah. So faith is designed by God to make a winner out of you. Amen. So he says your faith is flourishing. Your faith is increasing abundantly. Your faith is growing more and more. Your faith is growing exceedingly. Amen. Which should imply if your faith is growing more and more and your faith is uh, growing exceedingly, then it should imply you're experiencing more miracles, more impossible situations becoming possible, more financial breakthroughs taking place in your life and more victories. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I don't think all of you heard that. If your faith is growing, if your faith is flourishing, and if your faith is growing exceedingly, it should imply that you are experiencing more miracles, more impossible situations becoming possible, more financial breakthroughs taking place, and more victories you are having in your life. Hallelujah. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking about me. Praise God. How about you? We go from faith to faith. We go from victory to victory. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 2.14, now thanks be unto God, which always, everybody say always. always. Thanks be unto God, which always causes us to be, tri to always causes us to triumph in Christ. And notice the word is always. I, I will never understand how anybody gets out of that scripture. There's the will of God. We win a few and lose a few. Always. I probably told this before, but when I was a young boy, I could hardly wait to get old enough to start playing little league baseball. And, and so I went out for this team and, and uh, uh, we practiced for several days and then we were having our first game. The coach set us on the bench, stood up in front of us, said, now boys, it's not whether we win or lose tonight, it's how we play the game that counts. I thought that was the dumbest thing I ever heard. I raised my hand. I said, well, coach, it matters to me whether we win or lose. And if it doesn't matter to you, I don't want to play for you. I'm going to go find another team because I want to win. I don't want to play on a losing team. And I didn't play for him. I found another team. And we played them and beat them every time we played them because it didn't matter whether he won or lost. It did to me. And I played baseball all the way up to a farm league team sponsored by the Kansas City Royals. I had ambitions to play professional ball, but I never got that far. But it mattered to me whether we won or lost. Not only that, but I, I, my dad boxed in the Navy in World War II, and he taught me to box, and I've always loved boxing. I still love boxing. I know it's a brutal sport, and people are praying I'll get delivered, but I'm not listening, and neither is God. Because <laughs> there's a good fight coming up, and I don't want to miss it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. And, and so I boxed in college. And uh, I'd come home some weekends, my eyes swollen shut, my nose on the other side of my face, my head all swollen up. My dad say, son, what are you learning in college? I said, I'm trying to learn how to duck, dad. <laughs> he said, well, did you win? If I won, if I won, he couldn't shut me up. If I lost, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> did you win? If I didn't talk about it, that meant I didn't win. And I was doing real good. I had a pretty good record there for a while until I come up against a golden glove boxer from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The bell rung 
We met in the center of the ring. That's the last thing I remember. <laughs> he put my lights out. I mean, I thought, what no, what, how'd the train get in here? <laughs> Knock me out, boy. <laughs> it mattered to me whether I won. Nobody likes to talk about losing. And notice, they never go into the losing locker room. How did you guys lose? You, you, you never win. You're lousy. Why are you even playing? They don't do that. They go into the winning locker room. Amen. That's where the victory parties are. Hallelujah. Anybody having victory parties? Well, get ready for more than you've ever experienced before. Hallelujah. Now, another translation for uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 2, 14. I'll read the King James again. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Another translation says, thanks be unto God, who is always causing us to be in the process of being triumphant. Thanks be unto God who is always causing us to be in the process of being triumphant. I may not be triumphant at the moment, but I'm in the process of being triumphant. Amen. So don't count me out yet. I like the scripture where uh, the Bible says, uh, rejoice not against me, O my enemy, for when I fall, I shall arise. Amen. In other words, don't count me out. It's not over yet. I may be down, but I'm, I am fully intend to get back up. Amen. Amen. I remember I was asked to uh, speak at a professional athletes conference in Phoenix a number of years ago. It had 200, I mean, 2000 professional and collegiate athletes from all kinds of sports. And, and I was one of the speakers, coach Tom Landry from the Cowboys was a speaker and Bart Starr, former quarterback for the Green Bay Packers. And, and we were the three speakers. And the night I spoke, uh, I used the scripture that I just quoted from Micah about when I fall, I shall arise. And I preached on that. And then I used this illustration. I said, when I was a little boy, my dad and I, before we got a television set, we would hug the radio to listen to the boxing matches. Wow. Okay. Rocky Marciano, Joe Lewis, and my favorite old time boxer was Archie Moore. And we listened to their fights on the radio. And then finally we got a television set and they started having Friday night fights. Anybody remember Friday night fights? And I'd watch all those greats from the days past. And uh, so I said, uh, in 1954, I believe it was, uh, Archie Moore was fighting for the light heavyweight championship. And he fought this Canadian by the name of Yvonne Durrell. And Yvonne Durrell was one tough Canadian guy. In fact, he knocked Archie down twice in the first room, uh, first round. Archie got back up. He knocked Archie down again uh, twice before we got to the fifth round. Archie kept getting back up. In the 11th round, Archie knocked Dur Yvonne Durrell out and retained his championship. And I said, Archie must have read before he went into that fight, when I fall, I shall arise. <laughs> I had no idea that Archie Moore was in the back of the room and he stood up and said, you too young to remember that fight. How do you remember that fight? And it was Archie Moore, one of my great, you know, athletic heroes and got to meet him that night. Amen. He just would, he wouldn't quit. Just kept getting back up. The Bible says in Proverbs, a righteous man falleth seven times and riseth again. I tell people, if the devil knocks you down seven times, the way you beat him is get up eight. Just keep getting up. Brush yourself off and say, devil, it ain't over yet. When I fall, I shall arise. This scripture says, God is always in the process, always causing us to be in the process of being triumphant. So right now, whatever you're going through, and it looks like winning is absolutely impossible. Don't go around saying that. Amen. Just when somebody says, well, how goes the battle, brother? Just say, I'm in the process of being triumphant. Thank you. Amen. I'm in the process of being triumphant. Try it. You'll like it. Say, I'm in the process of being triumphant. Say it again. I'm in the process of being triumphant. Now say it this way. I am always in the process of being triumphant. It's never over. Say it. It's never over until God says it's over. And God will never say it's over until I win. Hallelujah.
Come on, give him a shout of praise. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Now, that's my introduction. You ready to hear the sermon? <laughs> we said this morning that the Lord said to me that 2004 year of progression, advancement, promotion. And we read from Haggai chapter two and verse nine said, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former. That speaks of progression, greater glory. If I say greater glory, greater glory than the former house. Amen. So that means if you read stories about the glory in the early house, the former house, talking about God's people, the early church. And I mean, there were great miracles that took place after the, you know, the day of Pentecost. I mean, miracles all through the book of Acts, but that's still considered the former house. And he says the latter house, the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former house. So that sounds like to me, God's talking about progression, progression. Amen. And there's got to be a generation of believers on planet earth when it takes place. And I believe it's our generation. It's our generation. We are the generation that's going to witness the greater glory. Hallelujah. Now we said this morning that if you study the glory, you'll discover, particularly from Exodus chapter 33, that the glory is number one, the manifested presence of God. Number two, the manifested power of God. And number three, the manifested goodness of God. That's what the glory of God is based on what God said to Moses when he said, show me your glory. Okay. The manifested presence of God, the manifested power of God and the manifested goodness of God. And it will be greater in the latter day than it was in the former. Hallelujah. We are headed for progression. Can you say amen? amen. Now, uh, go with me to the book of Genesis chapter 31. And what I want to show you here is the very first time the word glory is recorded in the Bible. It's not the first time demonstrations of the glory took place, but it's the first time the word glory is recorded in the Bible. And I want you to see what it's referring to. Okay. Genesis chapter 31. Everybody there? Let me get there. This is talking about uh, Jacob and Laban. And I'm sure you know the story. And in verse 43, speaking of Jacob and the man, Jacob, increased exceedingly and had much cattle and made servants and men servants and camels and asses and so forth. Talking about assets, okay? Material possessions. And then notice the next verse or chapter 31 and verse one. And he heard, Jacob heard the words of Laban's son saying, Jacob hath taken away all that uh, was our father's and of that which was our father's hath he gotten all this glory. That's the first time the word glory is recorded in the Bible. And it's not referring to clouds, lightning, smoke, demonstrations of God's power. It's talking about prosperity. And another translation says wealth. Wealth. Now, I want you to do this. And some of you may have to do it by faith. It might be a little hard to get out. Say this, Lord, Lord show, me your glory. show me your glory. I need to experience, need to experience your, presence, your presence, your power, your power and, your and your goodness. And along with your goodness, with goodness prosperity. prosperity. You're asking God to see his glory. 
And one of the ways that he does it is to bring prosperity into your life, just like he did Jacob. Notice the man increased exceedingly. The man increased exceedingly. And they attribute that to the glory. Amen. When, his, when Laban's son said, you have gotten all this glory from my father, they were not talking about you stole his thunder. You didn't take his lightning. You didn't take his smoke. You took his assets. Amen. So the glory of the Lord, yes, it can be manifested through smoke. And I, I've, I've been in, I, I was in a meeting one time when the Shekinah glory of God came into the auditorium. So thick, it just rested on the congregation. We couldn't even see one another. And we just bask in it. And man, in a little while, when it began to lift, people jumped up being healed and delivered and set free. One night I was in Toronto and, and the Lord told me before going into the service, he said, the, the presence, my presence is going to be so strong in here tonight that many people will be, will be carried out and put in their cars because they they're, they're so drunk in the spirit from the glory of God. Little did I know I'd be the first one they carried out. I mean, the glory of God hit that place and it knocked me out on the platform. And when I came to, I'm back at my hotel and don't know how I got there. One night preaching Brother Copeland in, uh, uh, I believe it was Charlotte, North Carolina, the old Coliseum. And Oral Roberts was there and I was preaching. And that night the power of God hit that place. And man, we had miracles and it, it, it knocked me out. I mean, I, I laid hands on somebody. They fell and I fell. And when I came to, I was in the speaker's room and I'm laying on a sofa. Somebody carried me in there. And when I looked up, Oral Roberts was at the foot of that sofa, had my shoes off, massaging my feet. I said, Brother Roberts, what are you doing? He said, well, when the anointing comes on me like it came on you, I need somebody to massage my feet. He said, it gets down in my feet. Hallelujah. Amen. Now I love, I love being in meetings like that. Amen. And we're going to have more of them, but don't limit the glory to those kind of meetings because it also includes experiencing the goodness of God, which includes prosperity and even wealth. Hallelujah. Somebody give the Lord a good shout. Praise God. Amen. Like a friend of mine said when he got a hold of this, he said, We ain't going to be poor no more. <laughs> Won't be poor no more. Now, notice the Amplified Bible says it this way His son said, He has acquired, talking about Jacob, he has acquired all this wealth and honor from what belonged to our father. Now, notice. The Amplified translates glory into wealth and honor. Wealth and honor. And the word honor here not only means uh, esteem and respect, but it also means that which adorns, that which makes attractive, and that which causes a display of excellence. Amen. He has gotten our Father's glory and His wealth. Meaning that which adorned him, that which uh, made him attractive. You could, you could use it like this. When the glory of God is in and on your life, you'll wear fine clothes. You'll live in a fine home. You'll drive a fine car. You'll fly a fine airplane or whatever the need may be. Amen. That, that's, that's the glory. That's the manifestation of the glory that's bringing prosperity to you and honor. Amen. Amen. And honor. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the reason I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to. You can take it. That's the reason. I, I, what other people do is fine. That's their business, but it's not me. Okay. That's the reason I can't preach in ragged jeans with holes in them and a t-shirt. 
Because God's glory is on me. Yes. I said God's glory is on me. Yes. And, and I'm doing my best to represent Him by the way I dress, by what I drive, what I live in, and what I fly. Hallelujah. And I do it with excellence. Or the best of my ability. Amen. Now, what other people do, what other preachers do, that's, that's between them and God. But you're never going to see me come to the pulpit. And, and, and people have called me old school. Well, if I'm old school, leave me alone. It's working. That's right. But you're never going to see Jerry Savelle come to the pulpit in a ragged T-shirt and holes in my jeans and flip-flops. That, that's not me. Now, to me, if I'm old school, fine. I like it. But I'm going to dress based on the glory that's on my life. I'm going to drive based on the glory that's on my life. I'm going to live in a home based on the glory that's on my life. Hallelujah. I'm going to fly a good airplane. I'm going to hire the best pilots and I'm going to have the best maintenance crew. Yes. Because they, they are, I'm trusting them with my life and my family's life and my associates' lives. We don't spare on maintenance. We keep our aircraft absolutely perfect, tip-top shape as we can get it. Just owning an airplane is part of it. Maintenance is another story. Aviation wrote the book on expensive. Amen. And, and we believe God to keep our aircraft and our aviation department up first class. Amen. Amen. So notice here, he has acquired all this wealth and all this honor from our father. So glory here is being translated as wealth and honor. Amen. Say this once again with your right hand in the air. Lord, show me your glory. What did you just ask for? Not only manifestations of his presence, not only manifestations of his power, manifestations of his goodness, and with his goodness comes wealth and honor. Hallelujah. I thought you'd all be shouting by the time we got this far. Glory to God. I'm glad I came. I, I was happy before I got here, but I preached myself happier. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, another example, Joseph said to his brothers after they saw him and his prosperity in Egypt, he said to his brothers in Genesis 45, 13, you shall uh, tell my father of all my glory that you have seen. And he's not only talking about the esteem that he was now enjoying, he was second in command under Pharaoh from a prison, you know, to the throne, you might say. And he said, now go back home and, 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 and tell my father what you've seen, the glory that you've seen on me. What was he talking about? Not only his position and his authority, but the wealth that God had blessed him with. Can you say Amen. Go back home and tell my father what you've seen. Hallelujah. The glory. And he described it that way. Show my father, tell my father all the glory that you have seen. Amen. Now, there's another verse in uh, Psalm. Uh, I believe it's Psalm 40. Let me get my glasses out because some of my handwriting is in tongues. Psalm 49. All right. Go there with me. Psalm 49. Pray for my secretary. She has to interpret all this. Psalm 49. Another example of glory referring to prosperity. Uh, let's see, Psalm 49 and uh, verse 16. 
Be not thou afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. Well, wow, right there, right there in black and white. Don't be afraid when somebody is prospering and somebody's experiencing increase. Amen. Amen. And what did he say? Don't be afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. And notice how he's connecting the glory with wealth and prosperity. Say it again. Lord, show me your glory. How many of you could use some more prosperity? Amen. How many of you could use a lot more prosperity? How many of you are endeavoring to recover from COVID? Did anything, anything the devil steal from you during COVID? How about getting it back? And then some. Remember Job? Job restored what was stolen and then blessed him twice as much as what he had before the battles came. Amen. If he did it for Job, he can do it for you. Hallelujah. The glory. When God's presence and God's power and God's goodness are manifesting in your life over and over again, and you are going from faith to faith and glory to glory, then you will most definitely experience progression and advancement. Can you say amen? amen. Now, first Chronicles chapter 16, verse 34. And uh, what I'm going to say to you before we read that. Say this with me again. Lord, show me your glory. Lord, show me your glory. To see more of the glory demands you speaking more of it about it. If you truly want to see more of the glory of God, then it will demand you speaking more about it. For instance, Psalm, I mean, uh, first Chronicles chapter 16, 34, declare his glory among the heathen, his marvelous works among all nations. The word declare here means loudly proclaim. And then it also means throw off all reserve and boldly speak and affirm. What? The glory. Speak it. Loudly proclaim it. That's good. Hallelujah. Don't be timid about it. Say with a loud voice, Lord, show me your glory. Is that as loud as you can get? Oh, you got a little more volume there. Come on, use it. Now say it this way. I will see the glory of God. Say it again. I will see. And I will declare His glory among the heathen and anybody else who wants to hear about it. And the more you declare it, the more you're going to see it. And the more you see it, the more it's going to increase. And the more it increases, the more you declare it. And the more you declare it, the more you'll see it. And the more you see it, the more it'll increase. And it gives a cycle that is unending if you follow the principle, praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Throw off all reserve. In, in other words, don't be timid. Speak it. Hallelujah. Job chapter 22, verse 28 says, Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. The word established means confirmed. It means to cause to stand. It means to ratify. And it also means to make valid. He says, Thou shalt decree a thing. What are we decreeing tonight? The glory. Hallelujah. We're decreeing the glory of God on our lives. And as we decree it, it becomes established. It becomes ratified in the spirit realm and it'll manifest in the natural. In the little Hebrew, this phrase means if you uh, speak it and decree it long enough, eventually it will become a common occurrence in your life. And see, the problem is 
people get excited about it when they hear it in a meeting like this and they'll talk it, but 24 hours later, they forget about it. Well, Brother Jerry, I, I confessed it all the time. Yeah, really? Or until you got home. Until you got one negative phone call. What are you talking then? James said, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, and don't let that man expect to receive anything from the Lord. Amen. Psalm 27 says this. Psalm 27 verse, I mean, Psalm 35 verse 27. Let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who favors my righteous cause. Amen. The Lord takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. And it said, say it continually. Not just when you're in church and you get inspired. Say it when you get home. Say it when you get up. Say it when you go to bed. Say it all day long. See, these things work for me because I'm not preaching something that I don't do myself. This way I live 24-7. Amen. I, I don't just preach this, and then I live some other way. This is the way I live all the time. Amen. Amen. I continually talk it. I get up talking it. That's the reason, as I said this morning, the reason we print these prophetic words and give everybody in our church a copy of it so that everybody will be on the same page. We're all saying the same thing. We're all expecting the same thing. We're all believing the same thing. Yes. 2024, yes. progressing, advancing, experiencing promotion, and seeing your highest expectations fulfilled. Amen. Amen. And, and I'll wait about three months, and it's coming up three months since I preached this to our church, and I'll start asking for testimonies of how many of you are already progressing, how many of you are already advancing, how many of you are already experiencing promotion. And I'm already hearing testimonies, and I haven't, I haven't called for them yet, but I'm already hearing for, from people that it's working for them. Hallelujah. Amen. It's already working for them. But what, what, what's the difference? There are some people who are hearers of the word only, and then there's other people who are doers of the word. Can you say amen? amen. Reba, take this one with you. I wish I had a copy for everybody, but uh, I don't, but you can go to our website and get one. Okay. Decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. Psalm 35, 27 again, let them say continually. Let them say continually. The message translation says, let them say over and over and over. Well, I said it one time, Brother Jerry, that's not over and over and over. My wife and I will be celebrating 58 years of marriage in July. I told her the night I married her, I loved her and I haven't changed. but she likes to hear it every day. I talked to her before I came to this service tonight. And she says, hi, my angel. I say, hi, the love of my life. I love you. I love you too. If I keep talking about it, I'm going to go home tonight. You know? No, she likes to hear it over and over and over. What would you think of she would re the reaction she'd have if I said, Carolyn, I told you 58 years ago I loved you and I hadn't changed. <laughs> now don't keep asking me to say it again. No, she wants to hear it. I like hearing it from her. I like hearing that I'm, God made me special for her. <laughs> Amen. We're in love. Our daughters, when they grew up and they left home, they thought we'd be the saddest two people in the world. Oh, life just began, hallelujah. <laughs> we were having so much fun, they were calling one to be with us. Can we go with you guys? You seem to be having more fun than we are. Huh? And they're still that way. They're grown. They bless them with the grandkids, great-grandchildren now, and they still want to be with mom and dad. Hallelujah. Amen. So God likes hearing. 
His word come out of our mouth. The Bible says, my word shall not return unto me void. It shall prosper. Well, how do you return God's word to him? Out of your mouth. And he says, if, it, if, if you speak my word, it won't return void. But just speaking at one time is not going to cut it. Let them say continually. Let them say continually. Let them say continually. Leave here tonight and go home before you close your eyes. Say it. 2024 is my year for progression, my year for advancement, my year of promotion. Get up in the morning and say it again. 2024, my year of progression, my year of advancement, my year of promotion. Say it every time you think about it during the day. One month from now, still be talking it. Come into church a year from now and you're still walking through the door saying, this is my time for progression, my time for advancement, my time for promotion. Praise God. You just talk it continually. Talk it continually. Talk it continually. Hallelujah. Amen. Psalm 29.9 says this, his temple, in his temple, doth everyone speak of his glory. Hallelujah. In his temple doth everyone speak of his glory. How about in this church? What is everybody in this church speaking? Huh? That's what I tell my people back home. Everybody in this church speak the prophetic word the Lord has given us. Not just a handful. I want everybody. I want every member of our church yes. experiencing this. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. And one of the best ways that will uh, uh, energize their faith and, and, and cause them to uh, uh, de de be determined to do it is me as an example it's happening to. Amen. Amen. Yes, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If I was one of the congregation, I'd want my pastor experiencing prosperity when he preaches about it. I'd want my pastor preaching the goodness of God or experiencing the goodness of God in his life if he's going to preach about it. Amen. 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 So they see how Carol and I live. They see our ministry. We have offices all over the world. We have no debt. We owe nobody anything. Praise God. We do everything debt free. They see that. They see from time to time. I mean, I've, I've come to church and, and I'd had somebody ride a brand new motorcycle that was given to me. And, and I knew it wasn't mine. It was a seed for me to sow. And I've had somebody ride the motorcycle in the church and, and say, uh, there's somebody in here believing for a new motorcycle. And one of the guys that, that works with me, with me closely uh, and travels with me all over the world, Tony. He didn't know it, but the Lord had told me to give it to him. He's sitting over there, you know, and he's, he's kind of, you know, he's packing, he's watching everything, and he's, he's a security guy as well. And he's sitting over there and just making sure everything, you know, is, is running properly. And I said, Tony, it's you. And I pitched the keys to it. Now, this guy is, you know, over six foot tall, played professional football for the Seattle Seahawks. You know, a big man. You ever seen a big man cry like a baby in church? <laughs> that was fun. There was a guy hunting me down. I'm preaching. I'm doing a motorcycle rally in South Louisiana. And my last stop was New Orleans. And I preached at Jesse and Kathy's church that night, did a motorcycle rally. And the next morning, we're going to ride back home to Fort Worth. And I'm still in the hotel. And everybody's loading up, getting ready to leave. And I'm walking out. Uh, the, down the hallway and a man came up to one of our, our, our actually our uh, director, Bill Horn. And he said, where's brother Jerry? He said, well, he's coming down the hall now. He said, we're getting ready to leave. He said, well, I have something for him. He said, well, he'll be right here in just a moment. So I walked out and he said, brother Jerry, I have something for you. I said, really? He said, yeah, come around the corner here and I'll show you. He had a trailer with five brand new motorcycles on it. He said, the Lord told me to give them to you. I turned around and looked at all the guys and I said, come and touch me. The favor of God's all over me, praise God. 
five brand new motorcycles sitting on a trailer. I said, what are you believing for? He said, they were all custom motorcycles. He said, this is my seed for my business. I've started a new business and I'm sowing them into your life for seed for my business to prosper. So I prayed with him like that. And I said, now, are they mine? Can I do what I want to with them? No, no obligation. He said, they're yours. Do whatever you want to with them. I got them home and I knew five people back home were bleeding for motorcycles and I gave them all away. Hallelujah. Gave them all to them. Hallelujah. That's fun. I said, that is so much fun. When the glory is on you and you can, you can distribute some of it to other people, praise God. Amen. God wants his glory seen on every person in this building tonight. Lift your hand and say, I'm a candidate, praise God. Amen. Now let me wrap it up. Psalm 84, 11 says, for the Lord is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. The Lord will give grace and glory and no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Now the glory here is not cloud, smoke, lightning, thunder. It says he will not withhold his glory and no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. So glory here evidently is referring to material possessions. He will not withhold any good thing from those who walk uprightly. He will freely give his glory. Amen. A demonstration of his goodness. Amen. The Amplified Bible says the Lord, I love this, the Lord bestows present grace and future glory. Future glory. That means we haven't seen all the glory yet. There's future glory. Hey, and I believe we've entered into that realm called eventually. <laughs> this is our year to experience the future glory that's recorded in the book of Psalms. Hallelujah. Somebody say, show me your glory, Lord. Hallelujah. Show me your glory. Hallelujah. Future glory. Praise God. That means there's something on the horizon that's got our name on it. Hallelujah. Amen. The message translation says, uh, let me read uh, back up for a moment and read Hab Habakkuk or Habakkuk, however you want to say it. Chapter two and verse 14, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Notice the knowledge of it. The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of it. That means people are talking about it. That means it's happening so frequently that even the media is talking about it. Wouldn't it be exciting? And just watch for it. Your evening news and they're saying uh, today, good evening everyone, today, there are reports of the glory falling all over Miami. People, people are experiencing the glory of God in the four corners of this state. They're prospering. They're, they're experiencing the goodness of God. Amen. Tune in for tomorrow. We'll have more testimonies. Amen. 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 The knowledge of it Amen. shall fill the earth. Yes. That means there's a whole lot of it happening yes. for the knowledge of it to fill the earth. And everybody is talking about it. I used to read that scripture years ago. And I thought, how will the whole earth hear about the glory of God? Well, Satellite. I mean, just recently, didn't you see what's going on in Israel and you watched it right in your living room? I remember I was in the bush of Kenya. I'm talking the bush, what we call jungle. Couldn't even get back there in a vehicle, had to walk. And I, I'm, I'm in a village and I'm ministering and afterwards, we sat down and had a cup of tea and a piece of bread with some butter on it. And they all asked me. Now, you would have thought they would have asked me about, you know, the glory, favor. You know what they asked me? We're talking about in the jungle. They said, 
Dr. Dr. Savelli, they call me. Dr. Savelli, how's the O.J. Simpson trial going? <laughs> I thought, how you guys know anything about O.J. Simpson trial? <laughs> the knowledge of it spread the world. That was an example. When, I, when they said that, I, I got my answer right then. God, how, how is the, glory, the knowledge of the glory going to fill the earth? Well, how did the knowledge of the O.J. Simpson trial get in the bush of Africa? Somebody somewhere was able to pick up CNN or one of the networks and heard about it and it spread through the village. Well, just think when the glory of the Lord and the knowledge of it fills the earth. But here's the closing scripture. If this was don't get you, I don't know what will. Okay. Now listen to this. Hallelujah. The knowledge of the glory will fill the earth. The message translation says the knowledge of it, uh, the, the awareness of it will fill the earth. And then Isaiah chapter 60, go there with me very quickly. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm glad you came. You needed to hear this. Praise God. Isaiah chapter 60. Verse 1, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. But it doesn't stop there. Listen to this. And behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, gross darkness to people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. His glory will be seen on you. Does that mean we're going to walk around with lightning bolts emanating from us? Does that mean that we're going to walk around in a cloud? Does that mean we're going to be walking around and smoke is emanating from us? No. What is he talking about? The glory will be seen on you. He's talking about the prosperity that will come in the year of progression and advancement and promotion. Hallelujah. It will be seen on you. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. hallelujah. And then notice verse, uh, uh, verse five. Look at this. The latter part of that verse, the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee and the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. And if you look in your cross reference, most of your Bibles have a cross reference. If not, then trust me, this is what mine says. I'm not making this up. This is from the literal Hebrew. Forces in the literal Hebrew means wealth. And the wealth of the Gentiles shall come to thee. What is he talking about? A massive financial inversion. The wealth of the sinner laid up for the just. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You're going to be walking around and people are going to see the glory on you. How are they going to see it? By the way you dress, by what you drive, by what you live in. Amen. The prosperity that's come into your life and they will be attracted to you and therefore they're going to be attracted to the God you serve. They're going to ask, how are you doing this? Where are you getting all this? And you're going to respond with, it's the God I serve. It's his blessing on my life. It's his favor on my life. It's his glory on my life. Would you like to know my God? Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord your greatest shout tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. And then you're going to hear this. You're going you're gonna to get a Psalm 126 response. And it says in verse 2, They said among the heathen, The Lord, now this is what the heathen is saying, not what God's people are saying. The Lord hath done great things for them. When they see the glory on you, they're going to say their God has done great things for them. Amen. Amen. 
and I'll close it with this statement. I've won a lot of people to Christ over the years that I did not preach one word to. They just saw how I lived and wanted to know, how are you doing this? Where's all this coming from? And I'd say, it's the God I serve. It's his blessing on my life. It's his favor on my life. Would you like to know my God? And no one has ever turned me down. Why? They were attracted. Now they didn't know it was the glory, but that's what they saw, the glory on me through the prosperity that God has blessed me with. And he's no respecter of person. If he'd do it for me, he'd do it for you. Can you say amen? amen. I'm telling you, our God is a good God. Our God is such a good God. Everybody stand with me, if you will, please. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. What time is it? Dear Lord, almost 10 o'clock. I promise when we get to heaven, I'll give this time back to you. <laughs> Richard, why didn't you throw something at me? Shut me up. I didn't know I'd preach that long. Praise God. Well, have you got just a few more minutes? Because there's something the Lord wanted me to do before I closed the meeting. I didn't know I was going to be this late in doing it. But I, I was impressed to the Lord this afternoon to lay hands on everybody in here who desires it. You don't have to, you don't have to participate, but everybody who desires it to lay hands on you. The spirit of increase is on my life. The glory of God's on my life. The favor of God's on my life. You know, you ask anybody who knows me well, David knows me well, he's seen it. Eric knows me well, he's seen it. Hallelujah. And the Lord impressed upon me to lay hands on everybody that desired and to do what Paul said in Romans chapter one. He said, I long to come unto you that I might impart a spiritual gift unto you. In so doing, you will become established. And if you study the impartation of a spiritual gift, most of the time, the way it's done is by the laying on of hands, by the laying on of hands. It can be done by speaking words, but when God wanted Joshua to experience an impartation for Moses, he said, Moses, lay your hands on Joshua and impart some of your wisdom, some of your anointing. When it was time for Elijah to serve Elijah, the mantle fell on him and that, that anointing came on him. When, when Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, stir up the gift that is in thee that came to you by the laying on of my hands. So there, there, there can be an impartation. Now, you can't impart into somebody else something that you don't have on you. You remember that commercial? I don't know what it was, what it was promoting, but, but there's a man sitting on a sofa in this beautiful home and he has a little pet camel. And he says, opulence, I has it. <laughs> opulence, I has it. Talking about his prosperity there. Well, the anointing for increase, I has it. <laughs> and I can impart it. Amen. There are people that have come to work for me that were in debt up to their eyeballs and in less than one year, they were totally out of debt. There is increase by association. Hallelujah. So uh, before we close tonight, and this won't take very long if we do it orderly. And uh, so uh, Eric, would you come and help organize it for me? And I'd like to start in the back and you come up to the front. We work our way up to the front row. And as I lay my hand on you, you go back to your seat. And then the next section, start in the back. Then the next section, start in the back and work our way up to the front. And I'm not going to pray long prayers. Uh, I'm going to just pray right now. And I'm just going to lay my hands on you. And I'm going to, I, I want you to expect. That's the key. Expect. Amen. Expect some immediate changes. And when I lay my hands on you, I want you to say out loud. Where I can hear it and where you can hear it. I receive it. Yes. Practice it right now. I receive it. Now hold up just a moment. Okay. 
and we're, and we're going to keep them flowing. Don't, don't line them up. They're going to, they're going to keep flowing. I'm going to touch them and then they're going to keep moving and just so that we can do it quickly and decently and in order. Okay. Praise God. Are you ready to receive? Yes. Say this with me in the name of Jesus, as hands are laid upon me, I believe I will receive an impartation, a spiritual gift. I believe the anointing for increase, the anointing for prosperity is coming on my life tonight in a greater way than I've ever experienced before. In the name of Jesus, I'm expecting it and I receive it in Jesus name. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord David and as we do this. Okay, let's get started. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Say, I receive it. 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 Amen. I receive it. I receive it. I receive it. Hallelujah. Jesus, we hallelujah, I'll come to you, place. receive it in the name of your Jesus, hallelujah, now receive it, hallelujah, receive it in Jesus' name, receive it, receive it, receive it in the name of Jesus, receive it in Jesus' name. Receive it. Hallelujah. Receive it in Jesus' name. Receive it, sir. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it, sir. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive it. Yes, sir. Receive it. Receive it in Jesus' name. Receive it, sir. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Yes, sir. Receive it. Receive it. In the name of Jesus. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. And receive it. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, receive it, receive it, receive it in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Receive it in Jesus' name. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. Receive it. Receive it, sir. In Jesus' name. Receive it. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive it, sir. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. In Jesus' name. Receive it. And receive it. Receive it, sir. Receive it. Amen. Receive it. In the name of Jesus. Yes, you are. Yes, ma'am. Receive it. Receive it. In the name of Jesus. Receive it. Receive it. In the name of Jesus. Receive it. In Jesus' name. Yes, you do. Receive it. In the name of Jesus. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Yes, you do. Receive it. Yes, ma'am. Receive it, sir. Receive it. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Yes, ma'am. Receive it. You receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive it in Jesus' name. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive it in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive it in Jesus. 
Jesus' name. Receive it. Receive it, sir. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive it. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Receive it. Receive it in the name of Jesus. You got it. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, go ahead. Let's take a, a seat real quick. We still have to take up tonight's offering. We're going to see if we can get through it. What a powerful, powerful service. Who Jesus. My goodness. Um, ushers, please go ahead. Pass out the envelopes and watch out for my wife. She's in the middle of the, the altar. So pastor's wives need the blessing too. Hallelujah. Tonight, if you're giving by way of check, please make it out to Words of Life Church. Words of Life Church.
If you're mailing it in, please mail it to P.O. Box 630-790, Miami, Florida, 33163. If you're giving by way of mobile device, please text WOL Church to 77977. Again, that's text WOL Church to 77977. Press send, follow the prompts. And you can go to wordsoflife.com. You can give through PushPay or PayPal. And just ask the Lord what he would have you to do tonight to sow into his kingdom, to sow into this mighty ministry. Who Jesus. My goodness, the glory was here tonight. And a lot of, uh, man, you guys are going to see the glory in your finances. Who so, 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 so tonight. Man, you want to be a part of this, who this harvest. Hallelujah, Jesus. Ha, 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 ha. Glory to God. My, 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 my. It's okay. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Does anyone need more time to give? Whew. Hallelujah, Jesus. All right, let's pray over the offering. Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for the glory that has been imparted into our lives. Thank you for the anointing of increase that we have received. Thank you for supernatural progression in everyone's life, in their hearts, their minds, their bodies, their finances, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you that things have been broken off of people's lives tonight, off of their finances. Thank you, Father, even when people go home tonight, their debt is evaporating in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Houses are being totally paid off. They're receiving new cars, new clothes in the name of Jesus. They have vacations to go on in the springtime in the name of Jesus. Their college, college tuitions are paid for. Student loans are done in the name of Jesus. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you for it. In the mighty name of Jesus. We're just going to keep on going with you, Lord. Moving with you, Lord, and progressing. Next, Tomorrow we're going to the next level in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said? Amen, amen. Ushers, why don't you pass out those, uh, those offering things. Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I guess, I guess I better get a, a button-down shirt with a tie on, eh? I think he was preaching to me. Old school, old school, yeah, yeah. I might be a little too new school. I gotta, I gotta go back. Take me back. Take me back, dear Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, we cover you in the precious blood of Jesus as you go home tonight and as you come back tomorrow morning. And we just ask the Lord for sweet rest tonight in the name of Jesus, that you're refreshed, revived. Come tomorrow morning, if you can, hungry and thirsty with a spirit of expectancy, because Dr. Jerry Seville is going to continue teaching on the law of progression. Have a wonderful night. We love you. Bless you. You are dismissed.